Uh, you folks, uh, you think of our desert as a peaceful, quiet, pleasant place, and it is. It is most of the time, but sometimes, you know, we get those city slickers down here, and we have a bit of trouble. Not big trouble. I I'm going to tell you this little caper. I like that word caper. That's what the detective stories use on the radio. Well, this is the cold nose caper. It's laid, of course, in old Fort Oliver, that artistic place across the valley. Awakened by my dog Whiskers, thrusting a cold nose in my ear, I listened. There was someone opening the window of the desert rat editorial room up front. I got out of bed, and with my 45 three feet ahead of me, and Whiskers, my dog, three feet behind me, I went quietly through the press room, snapped on the light, and found a skinny little fella going through my drawers, the drawers of my desk. As I bellowed, hands up, whiskers, he went for his legs. The unsuccessful burglar surrendered promptly and stood patiently while I went through his pockets. I found 16 bucks, $16, just think. And I was as mad as if I had jumping cactus in my beard. Here was a buzzard who would steal from a starving editor of a five-page desert rat newspaper when he had $16 in his pocket. Whiskers and I let him keep $1 and pushed him out the window. And, you know, we think it'd be a good idea to kind of leave that window open from now on. Uh, that's a desert coyote's love call you hear. Some have given the coyote a very bad name, but all admit they're very, very smart. I, I have a little story of a coyote. You see, about seven years ago, Madame Bellows moved into a desert cabin up near the Accordion Mountains. She was lonesome. So one day, I took her a baby coyote. I thought, well, now, I'll, I'll tell her that as long as this thing is a baby, for about six months, she, she'll have a nice little pet, and then she'd better get rid of it. She didn't. She didn't get rid of it in six months. For two years, she sang to that coyote, night and day. And the coyote got to singing with her. It was grand opera, they sang. You could not tell one voice from the other. Real nervous it was. We, we laid the madam to rest under a tearful desert willow at the oasis a year ago. Hear him? There's that coyote again. He sings each night from the shadow of the palms. Some nights, when the echo is clear, it sounds just like a duet. Uh... I, I, I'm boasting now, and I'm very proud. My dog, Whiskers, uh, he played the part of the coyote, and uh, he knows he did a good job, and it's going to cost me plenty of hamburger. Uh, this wonderful desert of ours is chock full of surprises. You know, you probably heard of jumping cactus, old wrinkled... Old-timers exaggerate stories about how it jumps. Well, it does jump. But only when stirred by the swish of your pant leg or coat sleeve. Then another thing that comes in for quite a lot of publicity is the desert smoke tree. 
It has promised companionship to many a desert dweller. You see, this, it's the desert's one mirage that's always at work. From a distance, it's a mock campfire. It looks like a peaceful little spot that you might meet some old-timer. Then, of course, there's the famed barrel cactus. Uh, that's what the story is real about. Old desert rat Jake Topper claims you can turn him loose anywhere and he'll find water. Although this is sometimes difficult in our dry desert. But in a wild garnet sandstorm yesterday, Jake thinks he's a goner for sure until he comes across a large barrel cactus. And then he taps it and gets more than he can drink in a week, although he's willing to try. Just then along comes a very rude citizen who points out that a barrel cactus does not usually grow on the tailgate of a truck and furthermore, there's a, there's a Budweiser label on this cactus. I am smart, and my dog Whiskers looks like he thinks I'm getting old, thinks I'm stupid, clumsy. We old prospectors just have our ways of doing things. Yet last week I lost a little tiny screw out of my glasses. Couldn't find it nowhere. So I swept all the floors, put all the sweepings in the gold pan, poured in the water, and panned for hours till I found the little screw. But somehow, while I was working, I lost my glasses in that muddy mess. I have just put up four monuments, them are those piles of rocks that a prospector puts up when he files a claim. Well, I file on my backyard. And by gee, I'll mind my glasses this coming week, and I'll prove to Whiskers, that dog of mine, the boss. I'll prove to him I'm smart and a damn good miner as well. You know, I think in this day and age, there's nothing prettier than a little western gal with long, slender fingers a rolling a bull-durham cigarette. Agree? Your editor thinks he's the first to boast that he rolls his own king-size bull-durham cigarettes. Takes two papers. When it's hot here, it's hot. Today, it's hotter than the inside of Phil Potts' brick kill after seven days of firing. In spite of the heat, Hayward Johnny has just sprinkled the red tile floor of the Busy Bee store for the seventh time and lugging in eight more cases of pop to fill up the icebox. Somehow, the heat don't seem to bother Haywire like it does the rest of us. He's being the only one that's doing any moving and the only one that ain't sweating. Old Doc Beatty and the Colonel Cashin is playing chess in the corner, each dreading the time when it gets to be his move. Flapjack and Joe Topper is a carrying on a slow, well-worn argument about water witching. It's too hot to think about anything new, and even talking about water seems to help. Captain Catnip is warning the cat not to eat any more horn toads, and finally orders a bottle of pop for the critter. The young pilot is busy explaining to Calculate and Cal that tortoises is really built for plenty of speed in the water, if not on land, on account of their streamlined shape 
shell. I'm sitting here writing a little. No literature today, just a few facts and figures like the Admiral does when the Navy's a sinking. Here are the notes. 1.57 p.m. I look at the thermometer. She shows 116 degrees. 2.15 p.m. Haywire announces 119 degrees of heat and chops off more ice for the pop bottles. Old catnip Ashby is pestered by the heat to the point of jabbering to the cat. He just started telling it that Chinamen can tell time by looking at cat's eyes. 2.27 p.m. Joe Webb says it's 121 as he looks at the thermometer, slides back his sixth empty pop bottle and calls for a full one. Seven-eighths of the fun of smoking is seeing the smoke, says Calculating Cal, thinking out loud. 2.40 p.m. Flapjack announces the temperature is 131 degrees. At Greenland Ranch in Death Valley on July 10th, 1913, it got to 136 and one-tenth degrees, he says. If she keeps on going, she'll bust the record. 2.42 and a half p.m. Someone says it's 135 and five tenths. The trouble with classical music, says Lemonade and Lem, is too hard to whistle. 3.01 p.m. Thermometer shows 137 degrees. The chess game ends in a double stalemate. And I go over to look at the thermometer as the record is busted. It's swaying there on the wall, and there's smoke coming out of her. That is hot, I says. Then, as it swings, I see a little hole in the adobe wall right back of the bulb where a cigarette is burning. I look at Haywire Johnny, question-like. There's nothing like the power of suggestion, says he, ringing up some more dimes on the cash register. 240 bottles of pop sold, and them sizzling umbries don't even realize it's been raining outside for the last two hours. Many a desert collector has poked around a ghost town dump to find an amethyst-colored whiskey bottle or spoon holder to put on the shelf. The magic of years of desert sunshine, he will say. The beautiful purple of the whiskey bottle that's laid for years. Thirty years ago, here in Borrego Desert, Whiskey Joe was picking a hole in the side of Santa Rosa Mountain, up above Rock House Canyon, getting just enough gold to keep him in beans, prunes, and whiskey. He would go to Westmoreland for grub and whiskey about every two weeks. Coming through Borrego on his way back, he always loaded his canteen at the Borrego Springs, and would finish his second bottle, heading for his trail that went straight through Clark Dry Lake. That is, Whiskey Joe went straight when there was a big moon. But when the night was black or there was a sandstorm blowing, sometimes he would circle on that flat, smooth dry lake, a cussin, as he tried to find trace of his trail. One night, in a sandstorm, Joe saw one of his empty bottles, then another, and they helped him get a line on his way across. This gave Joe an idea. He started saving those whiskey bottles. He would cut a greasewood stick, push them in the clay, 
the bottle over them to mark the trail. In about seven years, on a bright moonlight night, Joe's trail looked like Broadway. On a dark night, Joe had very little trouble following that trail, drunk or sober. A couple of years after the trail was all fixed, Joe's little vein of gold played out. He couldn't get enough gold to get both food and whiskey. So Joe took his few belongings, and instead of dropping down the trail on the Borrego side, he went up and over the mountain. Then one day, after spending some time around 29 palms, he sees a fellow selling some desert tourist colored glass and gets up to two dollars and a half for a well-colored whiskey bottle. Joe lost no time getting him a string of burrows and hot-footing it back to his old trail on the dry lake. Loaded 2,000 fine purple bottles, took them to the dealers, sold them for two dollars and a half a piece, netting him five thousand dollars, and then sold the string of burrows at a profit of a hundred and fifty dollars. Not bad for Borrego. This story has a moral all desert folks should heed. Never break a whiskey bottle. One of the nicest gestures I know was made at Old Goldfield. It's the story of a much-loved doctor that had passed on about the time Goldfield faded. The few not-too-prosperous citizens that laid the good doctor away had no way of marking his grave in the manner his unselfish life so richly deserved. They didn't do too badly. His sign was used as a headstone, Dr. Homer Rogers, upstairs. The old-timer put a lot of stress in the fact that the borough was the champion helper when you were out looking for gold mines. This little story proves it. It was Sandy Walker a-talking to the regular bunch of county sitters here at the Busy Bee store. And you what's prospecting with Fords is out of luck. You won't find any gold. Why, these cuts roads and railroads into mountains and through deserts and across all kinds of land for years and never hit gold on roads. You got to get out with a burrow to find it. I've been out here in the desert 26 years, six years hunting gold and 20 years hunting for my burrows. I didn't find my mine while I was hunting gold either. I found it while I was hunting those dad burn runaways. Them Ford riding prospectors wasn't saying nothing, just looking at each other like sheep. Did you ever think what us desert rat owes to burrows, he says? What about those water holes, every last one of them, covering 1,500 miles from here clear up to Snake River? There known to us because a burrow found him. You don't have to hunt fords, says Jake Tupper. I suppose that's mighty consoling, snorts Sandy, as he steps outside. Then all of a sudden the air gets blue. It's Sandy letting out the longest, finest string of cuss words we've heard in these parts. I come a-running to see what's wrong. It was plenty. His burrows got loose and was hitting off for the horizon as tight as they could go. Come, says I to Sandy, get in the ford. We'll round him up. As we chugged along on three cylinders, the old flivver hotter than a cowboy's pistol on Fourth of July, Homeward bound after hours of high-class cussing and wrangling, 
Iowa's admitting to Sandy that Burroughs' rate prize won for enlarging the desert cuss word vocabulary. Stop, stop, he yelled to Sandy. Look across the wash there. That's likely looking rock yonder. And that, dear posterity, is when and where we staked out our claim on the now famous Burrow Ford mine. Burrow comes before Ford in the name. About 13 years ago, Lem walks into the store and asks me if this is nowhere California. I says no, but allow me a circle of 100 feet The rest for miles in every direction is just nowhere in particular. That's better yet, says he. I'll stay. I thought him strange then, but I know him now. He's a sort of a desert efficiency expert. Goes around figuring on what he can do without. Seems the first thing he eliminated was his background. His family had wore themselves out carrying around a lot of choice junk they brought out from Arkansas by ox cart in the 80s. And what they had picked up since. He was born into this mess of stuff and hated it. As soon as it became his, he unloaded it. Then the eliminating idea got hold of him, and he couldn't stop. He makes a clean sweep of the relations, shakes off the wife, gets rid of the mother-in-law, unloads the house and lot, discards the auto, ousts the cat, discontinues the insurance and his mailing address, drops religion, clears the deck of friends, and bails out his business. He says you can't wash a lot of dishes if you only have one plate, one cup, and no saucer. Lem don't do a thing much but do without. Says 99% of our troubles could be done away with if we wouldn't accumulate. Everybody likes Lem and his particular preaching, but it weren't till a big songwriter fella come all the way out here from New York that we knew how powerful his preaching was. He'd heard about Lem and tells me that Lem's been living the life and lyrics of a song he wants to write. Now lots of people have had songs writ about him because they did something like stood on the burning deck, made goo-goo eyes, ran out of bananas, or headed for the last roundup. But Lem gets into this song because he don't do nothing, ain't got nothing, don't plan to do nothing but nothing. I sees that this songwriter fella meets Lem, but Lem don't help at all. He throws this song writing fella way off the track. First, says Lem, why have new songs? The best ones are the old ones, and they're a darn sight easier to remember. Then Lem gets to proving to this fella and a trying to convert him into believing that it ain't worthwhile writing a song. Well, anyway, the songwriter sits down to the old piano, puts down a few dots on what Lem says is perfect music. Just lines, empty lines. The hot weather, Lem's slow-moving, sleepy way of saying there ain't no use doing nothing and a sage julep or two all helped to sell this fella on doing nothing till he could do it almost as good as Lem. So there weren't nothing done on the new song. 
Lots of fellas can do nothing in short, fast spurts, but nobody's been able to compete with Lem for very long. This songwriting fella doing well, stretching his legs as far as Lem's, and had gotten to a point where he could look at the critters in the pasture across the way without counting them. He was making progress. Then, he wire Johnny stops it all one day by running in and handing him a city telegram. Lem just looks up slow and says, Don't open it. It's only trouble. But he does, and it was. The people at Prince's Music wants to know where the song is. You're going to hear that song. You're going to hear it a lot. It's got a nice, lazy swing to it. It fits Lem, all right. And here's how it got written. All the time, Lem and that fella was arguing, or I better say agreeing, them flies was writing the music, lighting on them empty papers and putting dots on and between the lines. While the fella was packing up, Lem says, Quick, Johnny, get the flit. If you don't, those tobacco-chewing flies are going to load him down with a couple of operas, and he'll never escape. Pack rats, dynamite, and earthquakes. You know about dynamite and earthquakes. I just want to say a little word about our pack rat, the desert's cutest critter. Pretty little fella. The trade rat or pack rat has the face of a gentle rabbit or chinchilla, a long, bushy, squirrel-like tail, round ears, and eyes like a girl from New Orleans. They have queer little tricks of shuffling your belongings around and swapping with you. But I want to tell you this story where the pack rat was the hero. Dry camp blackies, mine was petering out. Lots of work, not much gold. Then one day, blackie went to a newly opened box of dynamite to find three sticks gone and three pieces of rich gold ore replacing them. Blackie got out his kit to find that there was more gold in those three pieces than he'd mined in the last three weeks. So Blackie opened three more boxes of dynamite. Three weeks later, the dynamite boxes were empty, but Blackie loaded his burrow with rich ore and headed for the Mojave ore market. As he headed down the trail, that Tehachapi earthquake hit. And Blackie, looking back, saw his mine and the hill for a quarter of a mile around popping like popcorn. The bouncing rocks touching off the rat's loads. Those little rascals that carried that dynamite all over the hill. Blackie says after he gets over this, his last big drunk, why he's going back and see if those pack rats put that dynamite in the right places. Thanks to those pack rats, Blackie now owns the Rolling Stone Cafe. They did. Don't, don't think for a minute that the desert rat, that's the old-timer, hasn't a keen sense of humor and great showmanship. Death Valley Scotty stayed on the front page, the center of the stage, for a period of 50 years. And the only other person I know that was able in my lifetime to do that was George Bernard Shaw. You can rap. Teddy Roosevelt up in about 25 years, Will Rogers in about 20, 
and all our great, great Westerners uh, came and went. Scotty was right there on front page for 50 years. In a desolate canyon over a hundred miles from a railroad or a town, utter desert all around, in Death Valley, the hottest, driest spot in America. Out of these scorched mountains, squeezed by the weight of them, leaks a little magic brook. Here, Scotty dreamed of a castle and said to himself, this is the place. Here where it was so still, why that whisper sounded so loud it just had to be. To me, Scotty was a Pete D. Barnum, a Don Quixote, a Rip Van Winkle, all in one. Today, you can visit the castle. It's a mad dream come true, and you will find, as I did, that Scotty is there, everywhere. You can walk right into his dreams. The good folks at the castle know all of this. His dogs do too. And a sweet lady dweller, after I had looked at a new batch of kittens, told me this for sure. She says, Scotty loves that little strangely spotted one. And you know, somehow, I was sure of it. Your editor hopes someday to sleep the night in Scotty's bed, to look up at the pictures of Buffalo Bill, Pawnee Bill, Annie Oakley, Will Rogers, then put his head on Scotty's pillow and try to redream some of those old showman's million-dollar dreams. Any red-blooded man in the West can tell you how to get to Death Valley. Yes, they have accommodations at Scotty's Castle year-round. You know, a typical tourist is a guy that'll drive 3,000 miles and stand up in front of his car and have his picture taken. He could have shot pictures of that car back home. He didn't have to cover Grand Canyon with it. On the windswept deserts of Arabia, they, it's said that they have 9,999 legends to our one. This is a rouse me to publish all the legends I can dig up and, and make up a few. You know, a legend is a lie that has grown old gracefully and been retold numerous times. And uh, this little legend I didn't have to go far for. And here she is, the singing sands of old Fort Oliver. You ever been over that way in the wind? For many years I've heard these singing sands, but I have a reputation of being just a little bit screwy, so I never mentioned it only to some of my closest friends until those boys from Calatech told me why, the why of it all. Those technical boys say the singing sands are caused by grains of silica, picking up sound waves, transmitting them to one another and magnifying them on the principle of the crystal sets of early radio. When the wind is blowing and the sands sing me to sleep, it sounds just like Joe Stafford. Only the sands hold those notes longer even than that gal Joe, and just as sweet. But when those singing sands get to sputtering like Arthur Godfrey, I know it's a warning of a coming earthquake. At times, this sputtering has started in time for me to get out of bed, pour one or sometimes two glasses of whiskey before the quake hits. 
Makes things kind of okay, because I've known bottles to slide off of shelves in earthquakes. The, uh, the best way to become known as a desert rat and a storyteller is to speak well of the ones that have been ahead of us, that, that made a name for themselves in the past. This is a Dick Wick Hall story. Dick Wick Hall, miner, promoter, and desert humorist of Salome, Arizona, some 30 or 40 years ago, whose stories appeared in the Saturday Evening Post and made Salome famous. Dick discovered gold on three sides of a small mountain, setting out in the desert. And as digging was hard and slow in the hot summer sun, he figured a way to do the job in a big way. His way was simple. A hundred people put in a hundred dollars each. All the money to be spent for dynamite. The stockholders to be on hand to walk in and pick up their own gold on the day set for the blast. The day came. And so did the stockholders. There was never anything like it. Some said there was a tidal wave went up the Colorado River 60 miles after that blast. After the dust settled, the stockholders went in to pick up their gold. But there was no gold. A few showed their disappointment. Some talked nasty. But an alert Deputy Sheriff from Yuma stepped up on a large rock. The men gathered around him as he said, Fellas, you've had weeks of dreams, enthusiasm, and anticipation. You saw and heard the greatest blast you ever will see. And by damn, you got something to talk about the rest of your life. Let's give three big cheers for Dickwick Hall. Did you ever ride miles over a road saying to yourself, I built it? I don't mean telling the state or the county. I mean we folks did it ourselves, telling it all. It was on one of these days the whole valley turned out to break a new road to 17 Palms that I got this story from Singing Bill Whistler. He comes out, like he always does, to sit and play his guitar, while others done all the work. He'd sing all they wants, but he's through working. Me being the storekeeper and having brung a lot of pop for him to drink, I didn't work too. It was right after singing Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie that he sits down his guitar and says to me they were going to once. Then he tells me how he worked for years in the city, made a lot of money, and got all bent over counting it, and how the doctor discovers he ain't got three months to live, and not that much if he don't go to the desert to live him. When he was waiting for a rig at Trambadou, there's music coming from the saloon next door, a hearing which he gets to thinking he's never had time for music and thinks it would be great to pass along out of this world listening to it. He finds a bum that's playing for drinks on this guitar and tells him that he ain't had enough music. And the bum tells him he ain't never had enough good whiskey. And if Bill will furnish the whiskey, he'll furnish the music and they'll pass out together. Well, that fella, according to agreement, was to have all the whiskey he wants and gets it. And while he had the DTs, Bill gets to sitting in the sun where he can watch the cactus and sagebrush and starts a-picking on the guitar. 
He's thinking how the cactus has got hundreds of years to live and probably don't give a damn. And he's got to go like hell to learn more in one tune than the time allotted him. He stays at it and gets so interested he forgets to tear the pages off the calendar. And pretty soon, the first he knows, he's been dead for two months and a half and can play six tunes damn well. That, he says, was 14 years ago. And I still ain't had enough music. Where's the other fella, I asked. Preaching temperance, running a little mission over at Yuma. He got enough of what he wanted, but he cracked under the strain. 